Hey everybody, this is Curtis React. Today we're gonna to react to a video by Kurt Skazat that says you're a dream of the universe, according to science. And I wanna to react to this, I haven't seen it, it's on the YouTube trending, and know it's gonna be making big sweeping claims about the nature of reality. I love those kind of sleep sweeping claims. Let's see if it is gonna mesh with what I believe or if I'm gonna be educated or if I'm gonna dis buys it. Absolutely everything you think about yourself and the universe could be an illusion. Why didn't anyone tell me that earlier? Okay, well what's the reality? As far as you know, you are real and exist in a universe that was born 14 billion years ago and that gave rise to galaxies, stars, the Earth, and finally you. Except, maybe not. You may actually not exist for real, but be the dream of a dead universe. I feel like science used to say, back in the good old days, it would say, oh, there's such thing as gravity, which is something meters per second squared. And now I'm the dream of a dead universe. I guess, you know, you wake up and you're like, that's a weird dream. Maybe I'm that kind of dream. You and everything you think exists. Crazy as it sounds, this may be an unavoidable consequence of our best scientific theories about the universe. I just want to say, a lot of people say the, the, the spirituality stuff that I talk about and Swedenborg's visions and stuff, that sounds crazy. Well, now everything sounds crazy. He has to admit, look, we're, we're basing, we, we got all these scientific theories. What I'm going to say sounds crazy. It could just be unavoidable that the truth about things is not like you think it would be. It's going to sound weird. Weird stuff is here to stay. Okay, this is a bit much. Let's start at the beginning. We need to understand three concepts for this idea to make sense. One, the arrow of time. What distinguishes the past from the future? Uh, the past already happened. Put a drop of red ink into a glass of water and you see the ink spread until it fills the container, but never the opposite. Colored water where ink spontaneously concentrates and becomes a drop at the surface again. Time always seems to flow in the direction in which the ink spreads. But if you take a microscope, all you will see will be a swarm of molecules colliding at random. There are no rules, no forwards and backwards. Every individual motion that happens can occur in reverse. Wait, so you're saying that when you get down to the little tiny ink blob level, it doesn't, it just things scooching around, so it doesn't break any bigger law, but wouldn't, wouldn't they already all have their tracks that they go on? You just can't tell what the bigger picture is? Okay. What, what would I know? Great animation, by the way. Very satisfying. I like the guy's voice. I'm, I'm saying, I'm entertained. Well, this arrow of time is not actually fundamental, but a matter of probability. When ink molecules spread to fill a glass, there are many different slots of space they can occupy, and therefore many different possibilities to combine them. And just like your chances of winning the lottery grow the more tickets you have, the probability that ink molecules will end up filling the glass is much higher than the probability that they'll concentrate in just one spot. I'm lost. I mean, I'm a little bit found, but how did we go from they're just objects and they're scooching around to probability? Hey, this is like the, the, the dumb guys trying to understand science. If I roll these marbles on the table, they're all, they just roll to their spots. So how did we get to probabilities with little bits of ink? So it's not that the ink forming a drop again is forbidden by the laws of physics, it's just extremely unlikely. Okay, never mind, I get that. Yeah, like what What are the chances they would all go back? The, the, the conditions for like, here's a little drop and the drop falls and it hits this, that gravity, everything pushes things in that direction. And we'd have to get some weird forces going on in order for that. To see it, you'd have to wait about 10 to the power of 100 sextillion years. A one followed by 100 sextillion zero. I know that. I'm just kidding. But what forces, what, if you just waited around, like what, what forces would make it do that? If you had this much time to spare, eventually, by pure random chance, you'd see a red blob form again. Really? Like if you're just sitting by the glass, they would, do, because they'd be in constant motion, eventually you'd see that happen. Well, I didn't know that. Okay, let's move on to idea two. Two, the far future of the universe. Our universe was born 14 billion years ago in the Big Bang. It expanded and evolved to give rise to the myriads of galaxies and things. In other words, the universe is kind of a glass of water with a lot of ink doing stuff. It has an arrow of time. Who's that blue guy? Is that me? It seems to be getting bigger at an ever increasing speed because of dark energy. Basically, everything in it is getting more and more diluted. In about 100 trillion years, the last star will die. That's depressing. And it's depressing that everything's zooming apart from everything else. I, I, I like the stars. 
I want him to go away. Then, few interesting things will happen for the next few decillions, vantillions, and googles of years. Eventually, the universe will be a dark place fully dominated by dark energy. But, th but, but who? Who's that in the middle? You might think that this would lead to the ultimate death of everything, but dark energy has one last surprise for you. In a universe dominated by dark energy, space expands so dramatically that it creates a cosmic horizon around you, a border beyond which nothing will ever be able to reach you, not even light. So for every practical purpose, the universe has become a glass of finite size about 36 billion light years wide, surrounded by an impassable cosmic horizon. If you say so, I don't feel like I know. Even though they're explaining it very clearly, first time through, like I feel like I could say, I get that, but I'm, I'm getting to be able to get that. I'm on my way, but I'm not quite there yet. We know that due to quantum effects, all black holes emit a tiny amount of particles, a phenomenon known as Hawking radiation. And so does our inside-out black hole. In the end, this radiation will fill the universe glass with particles again. At this point, so far in the future that giving you a number has no more meaning, we've reached the true final state. The universe has now become a closed box full of particles at an extremely low but finite temperature. And since they have a temperature, they undergo random motions. Or in other words, a glass filled with water and ink and an infinite amount of time ahead. Wow, meta moment. So you started me on this thing and then you talked about how we'll zoom around and I didn't realize we were in the ink cup the whole time. Okay, that was a cool moment. I'm interested. I was just in the midst of all that information thinking, how is this? Where are we going? What does this have to do with the dream thing? But here we go. Now we know. Thank you, Kurtz. Things are about to become interesting again. Three, typing monkeys and fake universes. They always gotta bring the typing monkeys into it. Everybody's talking about it. if you put a monkey at a typewriter. Particles are bumping into each other over and over and over again, creating every combination of particles that's possible. They're like a monkey typing at random on a typewriter. Almost all of the time it types gibberish. I feel like that's a pretty harsh way to describe this monkey's art. Eventually it will write the first acts of Hamlet, and with even more time, the complete works of Eminem. Why did it take longer to write Eminem than Hamlet? If ink in our universe glass generates any random arrangements of particles, what could they be? Well, a spontaneous fluctuation could give rise to a planet, or to a galaxy, or even to a lot of them. So maybe our universe has already ended, and all we see around us is a pop-up universe. Not a universe that evolved from a Big Bang, but one that fluctuated into existence by pure chance and that, like the drop of ink, will only exist for a while before dissolving again. But wait a second. So if you're saying that the, the difference between what you say might be going on and what we thought was going on is that what we thought was going on is you could trace the progression of the universe back to when it started and there was this Big Bang and it did all this stuff. But really, the Big Bang all kind of dissipated and did all this crazy stuff. And then the black holes shot out little particles and it souped around for a gazillion years and then it reconstituted this universe that we have now um why could we look back like we do i mean why, why do you see like it reconstituted everything including like the i don't even know what it is that people use like the microwave background the things people use to calculate the age of the universe like those constituted accurately alongside it and then also, why would it mirror something that has been rather than just something that never has been? There's probably answers to these things. I'm just trying to show you what is my like, pea brain doing as I'm watching this. Verses could be similar to ours, but with funny glitches. In some of these universes, dinosaurs are riding snails. I guess this is what it's talking about, but it seems so improbable that we'd be in the universe that has this whole chronology to it that we could feel like we detect, right? Any, but I'm saying, if dinosaurs are gonna ride snails, I'm not complaining. I'm here for that. In another, stars are made of blueberries. In another, you're wearing a funny hat. I'm not wearing a funny hat in any universe. I'm not wearing a funny hat in any universe. Scientists in such universes wouldn't understand those glitches, so maybe the greatest mysteries of physics are just nonsense bugs of our pop-up universe. But we, I don't know, man, we've had a pretty, not that I'm trying to argue with Kurtz Katkat, but I just like to argue about 
this stuff because it's helped how I can like process it. W why is it progressed that we can understand so much of it? And it just seems like everything that was ununderstandable. Mm, next iteration, we figure it out, we figure it out. But not all possible fluctuations of our dead universe have the same probability of occurring. Smaller fluctuations are much more probable than bigger ones. A planet is more likely than a galaxy. But you know what's even way more likely? A human brain. Are you actually just a brain? You think, therefore, you exist. But what else do you truly know? In the end, your brain is just interpreting signals from your senses and creating a world that you experience. So technically, you could be just your brain that thinks the world is real. Well, why brain? Why like the, the object that we can zoom in and see? Why not just like the information, the consciousness? And if we follow the logic of the ink in the universe class, in particular, you could be a disembodied brain that, just by chance, emerged in a dead universe with your complete set of knowledge and memories. Oh, so that's that's how it goes. So but why would I be mine now? rather than the infinite other kinds of brains that would have what why is there so much logic and coherence to the universe that i'm in i'm just saying if you're telling me that this might be how it is i have a stake in this i'm a stakeholder of this reality you're talking about so let's see yeah how did we get to that so that's way out there just like you're saying but by, by what do you authority do you say these things this is a pretty bizarre idea but if we do the maths it's kind of pretty solid Let's compare the number of brains inside bodies in a living universe with the number of naked brains in a dead universe. Of course, we always, you know, how many times have I compared that? <laughs> and imagine that a total of 100 quadrillion humans will live around Earth, and that the same amount of people will live around every star in the universe. If we add this together, we get about 10 to the power of 41 brains inside bodies that will exist. However, in a dead universe that has had enough time to explore all possible fluctuations and that will exist forever, the number of naked brains that would emerge is, well, infinite. Oh, so this is, this is like the brain is the structure that creates consciousness. So why wouldn't it be that it, if all it takes is if enough particles show up and they form in this wrinkly structure that creates consciousness? But why brain? Wouldn't there be so many other structures that could produce? What is consciousness? Can you just tell me what consciousness is? I mean, if you're saying, yeah, okay, the, but why? I guess I'm a little hung up on why is there brain, and then why is the brain the vessel for consciousness? Why are when there are a million other shapes that were never thought of that also produce consciousness? So the probability that you're a floating brain is not only vastly larger than the probability that you're a real human; it's so inconceivably larger that we can't even meaningfully quantify the difference. How do you compare a number to infinity? So. Are you a floating brain that exists for one moment in time, then basically forever passes, and then you exist for another moment in time? But why you? Why would it be me experiencing that? Why, why would I tie, be tied to those two different brain formations that are a trillion miles apart? It's still, I feel like I'm still tripped up on the hard problem of consciousness, which is, sure, there can be some, if you're going to say it's a brain that creates those structures, I mean, that, that forms in that structure so that consciousness can occur. Why is it me? Why isn't it somebody else in the next? Who, who, hello, why am I inside this thing? And what am I? Maybe your life happens backwards and you just don't notice. Maybe you've lived trillions of times already. Are you the dream of a dead universe? Really? Like, really? Well, probably not. <laughs> you said probably not? <laughs> Because <laughs> I was like, I was like, hey, man, you're coming on pretty strong with this. And it's like, yeah, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable to be a dream of a dead brain in the universe. And but then uh, M. Night Shyamalan twist. I mean, you're probably not. You could be, but you're probably not. <laughs> That's fun. For example, dark energy could behave completely differently from what we think today and lead us to another future. Curiosity. That's something that's pleasing about watching this video. There's a curious attitude in it. It could be this. It could be that. It could be this. I like that. Also, how can how can brains function without bodies? If those molecules came back together, and there's a brain, if there was a brain just sitting in outer space, it would be a dead brain. Like it would explode and burn and all the things. But like, do brains need oxygen? Brains need a supply. Okay. All right. Sorry. Our understanding of the cosmos doesn't have a solid enough foundation for anyone to worry if they're real or not. Loopholes aside, if you were a fluctuating brain, all the laws of physics stored in your brain would have originated at random and shouldn't bear any relation to the real world. But we just used those laws to prove that you're a floating brain. 
So even if you believe that you are a floating brain, you'd have to admit that you have no good reason to believe that you are actually a floating brain. <laughs> He's coming down hard on these floating brain people. Floating brainers, whatever we call it. Brainers, I guess we call them now. Hmm, okay, so this hallucinatory trip might teach us something about our theories about the universe. But in the end, it's just a really weird exercise in what you can do with physics. An exercise of what brains and bodies are able to think about. So don't worry, you're not a dream of the dead universe. Probably. <sighs> okay, so in the end, it's this trip of like, look at, look at what could possibly be. And, and look at how we can take this not just random, but curated journey into the possibility with some of the wackiness that science is discovering the scientific method it is and, and technology and everything else that it works together to discover these things about the nature of the universe that leads us to say that these could be real conclusions look at this fun journey that we're on and think about it and that it enriches the spirit and and maybe points us in the direction of truth i love that curiosity i feel like and i don't know kurtz because if if they've got that the curiosity that extends in this direction or not, but I would love it if science would keep that curiosity that there might be a God-centered explanation for things. Plenty of science does, but but if like if we're willing, like yeah, let's go out and say, even though it's probably not, we have theories, and I don't even know how tightly each of these theories, he debunked his own stuff by the end, so how tightly they point to that. Yeah, let's go in that direction, but like, for example, with near-death experiences, I get it if you're saying there's corrupt churches that are trying to push a particular theology that they're using for power, so we as science are not gonna do that. Near-death experiences, there's so many people reporting those so, in a, such a widespread way, and it feels like there's some science that will engage with that, but a lot of it is just like, stamp that out. We're not gonna consider that as a hypothesis. No, of course it's not. It's brain chemicals or whatever it is. We're not even gonna study it. We're, yeah, get it out of here it's just no I, I want i want that curiosity to, that says hey look it could be that we end up as a floating brain in a reconstituted universe ah uh, it could be that we are human because there is a human creator at the center of existence and it could be that everybody that has these experiences that seem to point in that direction that is a way they are sensing they are an instrument of their own that is going out and sensing truths about the universe oh yeah i love i love these thought experiments there's no reason to fear thought experiments about like, there is a god sentient god there is an afterlife those kinds of things and i kurtz has got from what i know uh, sorry i can't pronounce her name i'm not accusing them of anything i i think they're they're awesome they educate people we we I, i've been inspired by their sort of art direction there's all kinds of things they do really great they're very smart they're great i'm not trying to say they don't have that i'm just saying as a whole as a materialistic culture and the scientific community at times can display what I feel like is, and I get where it's coming from. There's a lot of history, there's the whole Galileo thing, churches and things have, have been acting in bad faith a lot of times. Now that we are where we are, I love it if we could, hey, yeah, let's go explore what's true, but we, we're gonna be open to any of those possibilities. Uh, great video. If you wanna check out the rest of their stuff, there's a link to their channel in our description. I think about this kind of stuff a lot and how, how the things in our, that we experience in our world could be pointing us toward a spiritual explanation for life. If you want to see some videos about that, check out the links in the description. Thanks for the taking the time to watch me not quite know what they're talking about and get little bits of it because that was fun.